So um, it's our great pleasure to have Zhenjia here. And Zhenjia is a PhD candidate at Columbia University, advised by Sharon Song. Before coming to Columbia, he received his bachelor degree from Shanghai Jiaotong University. He was also a visiting student at MIT, working with Judge Jin Wu and Judge Terrebonne. His research is at the intersection of robotics manipulation, computer vision, and physics simulation. His work was recognized as the finalist for the best system paper award at RSS 2022. So let's welcome Jin Jia. And Jin Jia, the floor is yours. Oh, thank, thanks for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, let's start. So, yeah. Uh, first, thanks for the invitation, and it's my pleasure to be here to share some of my <coughs> recent works on deformable object manipulation. Let me this. So, uh, so most um uh, most of the robotic systems are focusing on re on rigid objects or articulated objects like the microwave with a rubber joint or the cabinet with pre with prismatic joints. But as we know, de deformable objects are also very common in our daily life. Um, for example, we, we have the rope, which can be considered as a 1D deformable object. We also have cloth and the dough. They are like 2D and the 3D deformable objects. So why we really use deformable objects in robot manipulation? So uh, from my pers perspective, there are a few challenges here. Oh, by the way, uh, feel feel free to interrupt if you have you have any questions. Yeah. Okay. And uh, no. So the the first challenge is the high or or some some people think it's even near near infinite degrees of freedom it can it makes it very hard to describe the state of a deformed object unlike the rigid object which can be represented by a simple six stop bounding box it includes the position and the orientation of the object but the def deformed objects require much more complex representation because the shape may change. For instance, a chain is typically used to represent a rope and a mesh for a, for a cloth. However, even these representations are only approximations since the actual deg degrees of freedom are much larger than the, than the actual particle number in their model. So this is the first challenge, and uh, wait. okay. The second challenge is about dynamics. So our understanding of rigid object dynamics is kind of mature, and then we already have quite, we all already have very good simulators to accurately and efficiently simulate the rigid object dynamics. But the modeling of deformed objects dynamics is much harder since it depends on many other physical parameters. So like in this video, the robot is whipping ropes with different properties. Yet, yet it's difficult for even a human to infer the trajectory of the rope. And uh, the last challenge is, uh, is under actuation. It, it's quite re related to the high degrees of Freedom. So with only sparse contacts, the robot cannot fully control all regions of the object due to its high degrees of freedom. For example, when the rope is fleeing a piece of cloth, it only grabs the up two corners, and it has no direct con it has no direct control to the bottom part. So this challenge makes it hard to design a policy for precise, mani precise manipulation. So these are the three challenges about 
deform object manipulation. So any questions here? Okay, I think I'll, I'll continue. Then let's look at the current situation of the, the robot manipulation. I feel pick, pick, <clears throat> I feel pick, pick and place is the most popular primitive. And uh, it is understandable because we have very high quality and factors. For example, we have parallel job groupers and we have, we also have su su suction based groupers. And uh, the grasping method for rigid objects is able to achieve a very high accuracy. And uh, another important thing is it, it is indeed useful for many rigid of dynamics tasks. But if we are in the context of deformable object manipulation, is pick and place still sufficient? I think I will say no. This, as I mentioned before, deformable object manipulation is much challenging. And uh, another thing is we may need to customize our end factors and the uh, action skills for each task since the properties of different materials or, or like different objects vary, they may vary drastically. So it is, I think it is quite, it, it is impossible to have a unified approach to manipulate all of them. So in this talk, I will talk about my two re recent works to use a customized tools or or actions for deform for de deform object manipulation. So my 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 first work is dexterity. So it's a new way of robot manipulation using air. So when we talk about robot manipulation, it's often all about contacts. Such, such as how to model or generate right contact in order to in, interact with this object. However, when, <clears throat> many common objects in our daily life are either inconvenient or even impossible to manipulate with contact. Like in the left video, it's inconvenient to pick up leaves one by one. And in the right video, it's even impossible to inflate glass with our hands. But these two tasks, they can be effectively solved using air. So inspired by this, in this work, we want to enable robotic dexterity with air. So we call it dexterity with an air inside the name. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we study it in the context of deformed object manipulation, and we pick these two tasks. The first is um, the first is unfolding a crumpled cloth, and and the second is to open a deformable bag. Both tasks are very challenging for contact-based manipulation, but they can be nicely solved with dexterity. So why do we want to use AI for robot manipulation? Here are, here are a few advantages. First, AI enables a robot to apply a dense force to. For example, we can e extinguish all these candles with only one blow. In contrast, <clears throat> contact-based manipulation can only apply force through sparse contacts, which is not efficient for, for other active objects like this cloth. And the <clears throat> second advantage is that Air-based manipulation allows the robot to reach objects beyond its kinematic reach range, such as leaf such as leaves blowing in distance. And uh, the last uh, advantage is that air is much safer to move at high speed, so it can operate safely around people. So to enable these advantages. <clears throat> Here is our system design of dexterity. It consists of three UR5 arms. Two are with grippers and one with an air pump. Since we do not require high speed movement, so this robot could also be replaced with other slower and cheaper types 
So we don't need this high quality UR files. And uh, last thing, the wait, the feature opposition is captured by a top-down kinetic camera. <clears throat> and uh, we can see none of these robots can cover the entire workspace, even the surface of a fully unfolded cloth. So long range in interaction by airflow is natural fit for this challenging task. So as a method part, we take a learning based approach to this problem. So our method learns to infer where to graph on the cloth, which is in the left figure. And then the and then two rubber arms then lift the lift the cross up and uh, stretch it in the middle of the workspace. And then the third arm executes the, executes the following action. Then let's take, in, now let's take a close look at this following policy. The network, the following network infers a score for each action candidate, indicating the cross coverage prediction for each action. The action with the maximum score will be selected for execution. May I ask a question? Oh, sure. So, so uh, my understanding for this is that you use a uh, pure visual observation as inputs? Yes, so, only a top, top down RGB image as input, yes. Do you think that if using um, other um, state representation for the fabric will be more useful? Like we include depth, I think include depth is, is better since from the depth image you can see like the wrinkles. Yeah, so give you a better answer. I I also have a question. Maybe it's it's a little bit outside of your talk, but um, at the beginning of the talk you mentioned several challenges for the different objects, mm. and I'm I'm also thinking about that. Uh, maybe self occlusion will be. One of the change parts mm. for different objects as well. Yeah, of and I see you only use visual observation. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that you didn't solve the subclusion issue at this point? So in this setup, yeah, from the top down visual observation, we cannot solve the occlusion issue. That's true. But uh, uh, another thing is, uh, in this task, I, I actually, we can still solve it with the occluded image. Since you can imagine when we grasp the cross, we only grasp the, the top layer. So we don't really care about what's underneath. So oh, I see. Even we know there's another layer underneath, but we don't have an action to directly manipulate that's part. Oh, I see. So maybe I can put it in this way. So in this text, your goal is to is, is to flatten the coast, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in other words, you would like to maximize the coverage of a coast. Mm -hmm. So whether the part is occluded by itself is not important because you can infer this by your, the coverage of the coast from the visual observation. OK, I see. Thank yes. you. But actually, so if there are multiple layers at, 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 at the, the same point, it's suffering. It's, uh, when, we do the, when, when we do the grasping, ideally it only grasps the top layer, but in real world, it's actually no. So it may grasp multiple layers. So that's very bad, yeah. So I hope like, in the future we may, in, we may incorporate some other like sensors, like the tactile sensor to identify how many layers are there. And, uh, and uh, we can do some local adjustments to, to leave only one layer. I see. That, that, that can be a interesting fu future work, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'll continue. So uh, after the <clears throat> after the first pass, 
the action with the maximum score will be selected for execution. And the opposition is then input to the network to infer the next following action. So with this close loop, wait, too fast. And uh, with this close loop, close loop policy, the, the action could be adjusted in time according to the visual feedback. Let's wait for the animation. Yeah, this, this is the second round, yeah. And uh, okay, so this policy is trained with PyFlex simulator. So where the airflow is simulated as a stream of invisible particles. So in the left video, it's a particle view. So we can see the cloth is simulated as, is visualized in this blue particles. And the air, the air particles is in yellow. And in the right video, it's our, uh, it's our visual, of, of, visual of, of, of observation used in our network. So here we, we, <clears throat> here we compare with two popular methods for cross unfolding. First, the, the quality study action, such as pick and place on the left, is not very efficient. And uh, it, it requires many interactions to achieve the goal. On the other way, the dynamic action, such as a uh, such as fling, is able to efficiently unfold the cross when it is relatively small, such as this shirt. And uh, how about our dexterity? So we can see that de dexterity is able to unfold this shirt within only two steps. And this is the second step. And uh, there is no need for high-speed robot movement. Since in the fling bot, the robot arm needs to move very fast to enable this action primitive. And uh, here is a larger clause, <clears throat> which, which can no longer be handled by fling bot, even with the maximum fling speed. You can see this video. So it grasps the clause and it cannot unfold it. Uh, so a better robot with higher speed are required for fling bot in order to unfold this large piece of cloth, which is very, which, which is much more expensive and dangerous around people. Then where dexterity has the same issue, from the video we can see, so this is the, the first step and the second step, it picks pick up two corners and with the airflow, it can unfold it. So with the help of active airflow, the dexterity has no trouble of, of unfolding this large piece of cloth. And I have more videos in real world. So we found our approach shows quite strong generalization ability. While the policy was only trained with rectangular class in simulation, it can generate well to, to different shapes, to different shaped garments, such as this like shirts and dresses. So the, sec so the third row is shirt and the last row is dress. Yeah, so typically it can unfold the class within like three or four steps. It's quite efficient. And uh, dexterity can also be applied to other tasks, such as this bag opening task. So here the goal is to open a deformed bag and uh, maintain its open shape so we can put other objects into the bag. We can first say without airflow, the bag opening is very small and it's very hard to put objects into the bag. We need a very careful and we may also have mistake. However, if the bag is opened by air in this video, the placing task is much simpler and we can even use the inaccurate tossing action to put objects in. So it can get enabled a, a, a much higher tolerance. So here's our system set up. So we assume the bag has already been grasped by two robots. So this, I hope this can be solved in our future works. 
and uh, the third arm with an airplane executes the following action. <clears throat> and the, the policy is quite similar. It predicts a score for each angle and selects the best for execution and adjusts according to the latest visual feedback. But, <clears throat> but since PyFast cannot simulate accurate aerodynamics, such as Bernoulli effect, which we found is very important for back opening task. So this task is directly trained on real world data and the supervision is whether the bag is open or not. This can be uh, automatically labeled from a side view image. So here are some results. So <clears throat> first the task is quite challenging for a contact based manipulation. But if we only have two contact points, like there is not much we can do. Even with the dynamic action, like shaking, we cannot open the bag. However, in the right video, <clears throat> we can see using air makes this task much easier. And then we also compare with the heuristic policy. So it directly aim for the center of the workspace, which means the following angle will not be, be adjusted. <laughs> from visual feedback. So this is in the middle video. So here we want to show the closed loop adjustment is necessary in this case. So we cannot use a fixed following angle. Since the initial graphing pose, so the <clears throat> initial graphing positions may change. So we, we need to actively adjust the, the following action. And here's another example with a large plastic bag. Here we can see the dexterity can open the bag with only one trial. In the last video, yeah. And uh, again, we um, in our experiments, the blowing policy learned using only one bag is able to generate well to different bags and the random grasp process. Furthermore, we, we also found the policy learned some very interesting strategy. For example, it tends to aim slightly above the back opening to leverage the Bernoulli effect. So it will not di directly aim for the open. Yeah, this is quite interesting. And in after the experiment, we also do this again. And we, we found it, it is indeed much more effective for this task to use this strategy to, 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 to aim slightly above the back open. So in summary, so in this paper, we show that air can be used to simplify the many complex deformable object manipulation tasks. Since it allows the robot to apply dense force field, expand its speech range, and provide a safe high-speed interaction. So with this work, we hope to inspire more innovative ways to, to use air in robot manipulation. Yeah, this is my, the first part of my talk. Any questions here? Hey, sorry, I have a question. So mm. when you sure, train the, uh, for the back opening task, mm. uh, you said that you train in real world, right? Yes. So you basically sample a lot of different like blow, uh, uh, blowing, uh, upper, uh, different angles, and then you you, you run the L pump, and then yeah. you just use the <clears throat> classifier to classify whether that leads to a success, right? Yes. And you just train the uh, the score network. Yes. And okay. And like you said that you only train on one back, right? Yeah. And it's able to generalize. Oh, that's yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And like, how long does it take? Because training in real world is usually. Uh, uh yeah. The <laughs> the data clashing is is. A long time. Uh, let me count. I remember it's ten hours. I think I mentioned oh. it in in this slide. Wait. Okay, I, I see. Okay. So okay. it's uh, over. Uh, yeah, we collect four thousand. Uh, sequence. Oh, and the internet gets see. around ten hours. So like a uh, overnight data collection. <laughs> I see. I see. Thanks. Thanks. But but uh, even four thousand is actually surprising because you have a very efficient system. Ten hours is not bad at all, actually. Uh. How did you actually label the data? So you said that this label data was. Uh... Yeah, so uh, in the 
uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see we have a side view. So can I? Uh... Yes, you you have. This yeah. Thing. So from this video, we can measure the the area of the bag using a okay. very simple background subtraction, and we set a, a fixed threshold to determine whether the bag is open or not. Okay. Uh, in in your model, are you using RGB input, RGB D input, or just D? We only use RGB. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. No, no, no. Sorry. In the bag opening, we use the depth. Depth oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. And, and exactly. in the in the in the, in the previous version, yes. Yeah, in the not close going. unfolding, yes. we only use yes. RGB. Since RGB is much easier to transfer from sim to view. Oh, very interesting. We I would have thought the I other way around. The major reason is our setup is quite simple. So in the cross unfolding task, our visual opposition is only a top down image, and the, the background, the table is pure black. So, so if, a quick question. A quick question. So for example, in the blower example, you said that the simulator did not work. Maybe. Maybe a two-part question. First of all, when you use the simulator, how much data did you end up generating? Uh, so you, mean... you were showing you were showing that example from Flex, right? Mm, so, yeah. how much data did you generate for training here? You, uh, you, you, you mean for the cross unfolding task, right? Yes. Yes. Ah, I actually I can't remember, but in this task we. We don't use a fixed data set. So it's like a uh it's a try and so it's but a self still have to, So you, we train the policy and we test it in the simulation and we collect more data for the training. So it's a loop. The data collection, training, data collection, training. It, it's a loop. So okay. So then how many like how long did that process take in simulation? I think for the training part, it's around like, let me see. Because I flex think, is not very fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just quite slow, yes, agree. I think it's around like 15 hours. Yeah. 15 but hours. Most of the time it's used for, it's used in the simulation. Could you could you go back to the flex slide? There is okay. one question I sure. have. Sure. Uh, uh, this, this, yes, this. the next one. Next, next one. one, yes, okay, wait, wait. Animation. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. This yes. <coughs> what is the rendering engine here? So I understand the particle view. Yeah. But what the is rendering, the we just engine? use uh, OpenGL uh, rasterization. So sure, the PyFS itself, it has its own a simple renderer. Even okay. OpenGL. Uh, yeah. OpenGL, yes. So this must have been very slow, right? Like, what is the FPS of this thing? FPS. If I only run this, I think the FPS can be, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's okay, to be honest. At least 10 or 20. Okay, and what about, uh, what, what is the resolution of the clock here? Uh, 720, uh, wait. Doing the rendering, I think I use seven. Number of particles, number of particles. Number of particles, okay, let me see. Uh, I cannot remember the exact number. I think it's around like 10,000, this kind of skill. Huh, so this blue, this blue object is 10,000 and you're, you're simulating a 20, FP, uh, 20 FPS with the yes. rendering. Yeah. Huh, very nice. Uh, for this particular task, did you also have any real data collection or real data was mostly just a showcase as in demo rather than did you use real data for fine tuning your let's no. Say, policy? No, 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 no. We don't use real data for fine tuning. So we directly deploy that in real world without any okay. training or fine tuning. Yeah. And final question is mm -hmm. you were using three robots. Did you use, let's say, some sort of coordinated motion planning for, for shared workspace, or you just move one robot at a time, or how does this work? Uh, first, we do the calibration, so all the three robots, they are in the same, like, world coordinates. Yes, yes. And uh, we don't do any further coordination part. So there's like, Understood. Yeah. yeah. Is there, so, like, a particular calibration error that you drive your system down to, let's say, a centimeter or, or 
or even low. They haven't had it. But for the grasping, I think the error in X, Y direction, I think it's quite okay. The major reason is, so the, the major issue when I do the, the experiment is the error in the Z di, 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 direction, which, which is the height. Since, well, since if, if we want to graph a, a cloth, it's very thin. So we so the fingertip should exactly touch the table, and do the grasping. So you, you, but you can always you can always trick there by using like a slightly softer table so that you can overshoot. Yes, yes. So in our setup, so we have a yoga mat on our table. So we exactly. will set it down a little it's bit. True. But it's still annoying when when the error is larger, especially when it wants to graph in the corner. So the error may maybe that, larger than, than the fine. center part. Yeah. One last question on the backfolding task where you okay. said I, we used RGBD. Where did you mount the camera and what camera are you using and how far it is? For example, okay. uh, like yeah. how are you getting, how good is the depth for, for, uh, for this particular object? Okay, let the, me... The bag, the bag part. Bag, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Let me, I think I can directly jump to that page. Wait a minute. Okay, in the right column, so the, the first image is our depth. Just for the input. I think the quality is quite okay. We we use the Kinect V2. The okay, and how far how far is it mounted? Like how far is it mounted from uh from your let's from say from the, the table? Object. Okay, let me see. From I the think table it's around like one point five meters. At one point five meters. Yeah, a top okay. down. Okay. Camera, yes. Uh, so the resolution that is the resolution good enough to distinguish between let's say creases on the object. I I think the resolution is quite good. It's quite good. So I think the maximum resolution of of Kinect V two is is ten eighty. No, not the resolution in terms of uh, let's say density, but more like depth resolution. Oh, that's resolution. Okay, so in this case, it's question was not since it gets only needs to distinguish between the, the end factor and the back. So there's no other distracted. So there's no other object on the table. So the, okay. the view is quite clean, I would say. Okay, okay. let's carry on. Sorry, uh, thanks a lot for answering all of these questions. It's okay. Thank you. And uh, the mouse, okay. So... Then I'll go to the next one. Wait, not this one, sorry. So, okay, after summary, so. <clears throat> oh, wait, oh, I think my, my mouth is stuck. Wait a minute. Okay, it's a lot. So this all only considers fibers, like the cloth or the back. But there are, any, there are many other kinds of deformed objects. And uh, furthermore, some objects may, May may also have more than one material. So in the next project, I will. Sh I'm going to look. So in the next project, I'm going to show our recent work on multi-material objects, and uh, we use cutting as our action primitive. Yeah. So this is the second part. So we introduce Robo Ninja, an adaptive cutting policy for multi-material objects. So a short background. So the prior works on robotic cutting, mainly focus on single material objects, such as slicing a cucumber. But in this case, actually an open loop policy is almost sufficient to complete the job since the robot just need to move the knife up and down. So, but in this work, we aim to learn a cutting policy that works with with multi-material objects, such as the mango, a mango with soft exterior and a, and, and a radio core inside. So to achieve this task, a robot, a robot needs to carefully cut off the soft exterior of the object while avoiding collisions with the, with the radio core. And the cutting trajectory should, should also um, to balance the cut of mass and the energy consumption. So we have these three objectives. First, it needs to maximize the cut of mass. 
Second, avoid pollution. And the last is to minimize the energy consumption. So first, I will show a demo of our final system. And uh, we use a, a low cost force sensor in this task, since we need to detect whether the, kni the knife has collision or not with the radio core. And the force curve is showed in the corner figure. OK, it starts. The robot first lowers, lowers the knife cut to cut into the avocado. And it, yet then it encounters a collision with the radio core inside. Then it retracts its state to a few steps earlier. And I use the collision signal. It will update its estimation of the radio core. So from this uh, step, the state estimation is not that obvious. But in the later step, you can see the it will change a lot. And then the robot will continue the cutting based on the updated state estimation. So you can see the state estimation change a lot after each collision. So after a few collisions, our system is able to iteratively update the, the estimation of the core and generates a cutting trajectory to cut off most of the flash out of the, the, the avocado. And uh, to better resemble real world scenarios, we can also execute the same policy multiple times with different initial rotation angles to cut off the soft material from, from different directions. So here we rotated like four. Are you using degrees. a Bayesian? Are you using a Bayesian estimate of the state? What you're saying, the state here being the, the rigid core? Uh, I will mention it later. Yeah. I will talk about like what's our uh, state estimation module and our cutting policy module. But in short, we just, uh, we, the input is some sparse collision points and the output is this binary mask. And we just train a simple binary classifier in simulation. So we, so during training, we, we manually sam sample some, some points on the contour to mimic the, to mimic the collision points. And it's tough. And its goal is to output, to, 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 to infer the mask of the radio core. Is that clear? I think I will mention yes. later. Yes, carry on. Yeah, and again, we can do it again. So we, cut, we will cut it in another rotation angle. Yeah, here it has two collisions and the finish the cutting. You can cut this three piece of meat. So, okay, let's talk about the master part. First, again, the sim simulation part. So before we start, it's worth noting that learning such cutting skills directly on a real world system is quite challenging and, uh, and uh, potentially dangerous. Yeah. So here we build an environment to support this multi-material coupling and a physics-based energy, physics energy computation to simulate this cutting process. So more importantly, this simulator is fully differentiable, which means it allows for gradient-based trajectory of optimization. And here are the objectives of this optimization and the cut of mass, the collision, and the energy consumption, which is aligned with our, our final goal. And here we show the cutting process in simulation in, in the last video. So the cutting trajectory is first initialized with a predefined collision free collision free trajectory and op, 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 and optimized under these three objectives. Here I show the optimization process. Yeah, so finally it can perfectly cut cut this look uh, finish this, this optimization process. And the trajectory optimized with our simulator are then used for the training of our cutting policy. Yeah. 
So here our method Robot Ninja, it consists of two parts. The first is an interactive state estimator, and the second is an adaptive cutting policy. And here the key is to close the loop between this perception module and the manipulation module. So the state estimation network takes as input the collision signals and then estimates the location and the geometry of the invisible core. It's, it's just a binary mask of this core. And uh, for the cutting policy, first it takes the core estimation. Here we use the SDF of this 2D mask. And it also inputs the current knife poles and an additional tolerance value to generate the cutting action. Here, the tolerance value controls the policy's conservativeness when countering collisions. So with a higher tolerance value, the knife will slightly move away from the core in order to avoid potential collisions. But if the tolerance value is very low, it will like strictly follow the contour of the core. So, so it's a balance between the cutoff mass and your, your potential collisions. So it is very important for real world experiment since the robot may get stuck at the same location due to some kind of like out of dis distribution issues. I will show this comparison later. So then, we design and build a low cost force feedback system for for deploying our method on a real on a real world platform. So the force is measured by a string gauge. Yeah, this one. Uh, so by a, a string gauge as an analog signal, it gets then converted to a digital signal and transmitted to the to the robot controller through this. AD converter and the ROS, 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 the Raspberry Pi Zero, and we assemble and we assemble all these components compactly in this very tiny box. So to effectively cut through a fiber-rich material such as mango skin, here we we manually add an additional like this kind of horizontal repetitive back and forth motion. You can see the robot arm will move back and forth. To cut off the mango skin. And again, here's a video of the second cut with the different initial <clears throat> rotation angles. Notice that this is the this is the same policy as what we use for cutting avocado. So here we have a, a unified cutting policy to cut all these kind of objects, no matter avocado or mango. And uh, then we can reuse. Do you the do you also do stiffness estimation for the object, or do you not? No, no, no. We don't. We don't estimate any physical parameters explicitly. And so that's like one potential improvement. Since if we have a better understanding of the material property, we can. So we can use, uh, like a customized like the the force threshold. Since for different material. We may need different force in order to cut through. Understood. Yeah, so we can use the, the, the same policy to cut all these objects from different directions to make it like general and practical for real world use. And here are more videos of cutting di different kinds of fruits, like the avocado, mango, the peach, plum. So notice that the knife may exhibit visible deformations. This is the, a very large scene to real gap, actually. And the object pose may also be changed during cutting. Since we assume the object can be stably fixed on the table, but in real world, maybe it's not. Like in the, ma the mango, the mango may, may shake left and right. Although we have this simple gap, but <clears throat> so are you are you using any visual feedback in this case, or is it mostly no? We don't use we don't use any visual feedback. Our only input so is force the feedback. sparse collision signal. 
we don't directly use the force. So the force will convert it to a binary signal. Okay. Collision or not. So this is all we have. So how, how frequently do you have this collision? Like what is the replanning frequency? Okay. The, uh, the frequency is around like 20 Hertz. Oh no, let me see. Uh, 1.5, 10 Hertz, yes. 10 Hertz. Okay. And so every, oh, 10, every the, 10 Hertz you get feedback on, is this in collision and what is the, so oh, do you for also the collision have- detection, No, 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 for the co collision de detection, the frequency is much higher. That's 80 Hertz, 80 Hertz. Okay. And we use this 80 Hertz collision signal and our policy is 10 Hertz. Okay. Uh, a more interesting question is, so during the policy rollout, mm -hmm. you only use binary con uh, collision signal, but not force signal. Yes, we only use the collision signal. We don't use the force number. And, and all of this policy training is yet again done with a purely simulated data. You don't use yes. real data for training. Yeah, no fine training. We okay. only use simulation machine. And then this SDF that you are trying to estimate, you assume that it's a planar SDF because you are cutting and then you assume that the SDF of the core is uh, uh, perpendicular to the knife. Yes, yes. This is our assumption, yeah. So okay. it's kind of like a 2D cutting scenario. So that's why yes. we, we rotate it multiple times in order to cut from different directions to, to be an um, extension of our policy. <laughs> okay, understood. Thanks a lot. So, yeah, so gap, so it may disrupt the accuracy of our state estimation due to this kind of like misleading collision position, but our current policy is still as robust to complete the task. Yeah, and uh, here I want to show why we use, why we need this adaptive cutting policy. So here we, we, we compare our method with a non-adaptive baseline. And here we use a 3D printed core and a kinetic sand to be our, our soft material in order to reproduce this setup. You, you can see in, in the left video, the non adaptive baseline, it may get stuck. Although the state estimation is quite accurate. So the state estimation is in Burong and the ground truth is in Gure. So well, the state estimation is quite good, but the knife is still get stuck. In contrast, our system with an adaptive cutting policy. So it may it is able to bypass the core after a few collisions. So here our policy may tend may it it may choose to sacrifice a little bit cut off mass in order to avoid future collisions. So this is the key part in order to complete this task. And we also compare our method with other baselines in simulation. The first is IR. So the kind of policy of IR is very jittering. It's not, yeah, it's not smooth. And uh, it may become too conservative after a few collisions. So in this video, you can see it sacrificed too much soft material. And the second is a greedy policy. So it will strictly follow the contour of the estimated core. Here it, it, may, it may choose some abrupt rotations. So the knife may rotate very fast and it may consume a very high energy consumption. And the last is the nearest neighbor and also our non-adaptive version. So both, both of them may get stuck. Yeah, although the state estimation is quite accurate, but since it's not adaptive, the policy may get stuck. Finally, what version? What version of the RL policy were you using here? Uh, can you say again what what, what version of what, Yeah, what like when you say RL didn't work? What RL were you using here? You mean which baseline? Which yeah, ba as in what was the setup for the RL baseline? And they are the, the same setup, so they use they use the same input, which is okay. the sparse uh, the sparse collision positions. 
and they, it's, they are also it's usually the, the reward function it's usually the magic is the reward function what reward okay, function for the, for the uh, the only re reward function we need is for the IR, and we use the same objective as we use the cut of mass the number of uh, the collision penalty and uh, the energy consumption so the same simulation environment with the same objective understood thanks and for the greedy and the nearest neighbor policy they are just heuristic policy so we don't need to write the reward so for the great policy since we have the core estimation so we can easily follow the con contour of the, the core yeah so it's a heuristic policy okay continue so this is the execution of our robot ninja I guess it's able to iteratively update the estimation and finally adjust the cutting trajectory with optimized energy consumption. Here are some quantitative results. We, we evaluated on both training and the novel geometry. And our method also performs other baselines by a large margin. Okay, here are some more videos. Wait. So I have some videos on the real world evaluation on this kind of 3D printed course. So, so use this kind of setup, we can quantitatively measure the performance. So we can measure the weight of the soft material after cutting, and we can reproduce all the settings for compression. What is the soft material that you're using? The, the red material? Kinetic sand. It's kind of okay. a child toy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And here are some performance on normal geometries. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Hmm? It's playing. Okay. Let's skip it. So in summary, we we introduced this multi-material cutting policy, and we also built a simulator, a differentiable simulator for trajectory optimization and then use it for training. And for the master part, it's important to it's important to close the loop between perception and the manipulation. And the the policy adaptiveness is very important to handle auto distribution scenarios. I think that's all for my talk. So finally I hope like with our joint joint efforts robots can acquire more and more new skills and, uh, and finally be become really useful in our daily life. Thank you. Yeah. Next Any sense, uh, Jinja's um, inspiring presentation. So uh, I think we can have uh, some question here. So is there any question? Yes. Uh, uh, can you go back to the qualitative number, quantitative numbers for the cutting? Okay, uh, sure, this one. Yes. Uh, what is the what is this number? Is okay. it like rate or what? What is the this uh, success rate? So the success criteria is both. Uh, first is just need to complete the cutting process within ten collisions, and the energy consumption should not uh ex should should be smaller than a predefined threshold number. And but in our paper, we have more comparison, like the cut of mass, the number of collision. So we have a large table to cover Understood. all the ma metrics. So here, I on only choose this. The Understood. In yeah. terms of the simulator, what simulator were you using? And and uh, okay. what about the dif differentiability? What uh, what parts are the different? What parts are you taking gradients off? OK, so let's go back to my side. So first, the the major part is how to simulate this soft material, right? So our soft ma ma material is is modeled using the elasto elastoplastic object like the snow. So we use NPM for the simulation. As the implementation part, we use Tai Tai Chi to implement this NPM. So most most of them. Most of my simulation part is borrowed from the testing lab, which is from Chuang and okay. 
and yeah, yeah, plasticine lab. Yeah, plasticine lab is is yeah. something we know very good. And and uh, so, how do you do rigid objects in in plasticine lab? Then, so for example, the soft core, objects right? are model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the rigid object. So the collision between soft and the rigid is to use the the <laughs> SDF of the rigid object. So we first compute the S, the SDF of the rigid object, and then whenever a particle is inside the rigid object, which means this SDF is smaller than zero, and uh, it will be pushed out to push oh, away from very, the rigid very object. Very neat, very neat trick. Yeah, and we and uh, we also use this to compute our energy consumption. Since when the knife. It's interacting with this soft material. So first, we can compute the <laughs> particle movement caused by the knife. And uh, the energy change of the particle can also be considered as the energy consumption of our, our, our action. So that's, that's how we compute the energy part. Understood. That, that's actually very neat. And then for rendering here, uh, you probably use the same Tai Chi render. No, uh, in this slide, no, we I export the thing and the uh, render is in in Blender. This in Tai Chi ah, okay. rendering, I can only render the Pascal view. That's quite ugly. Oh, okay. oh <laughs> but, that's very nice. Very yeah. smart. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is very well done. Very smart. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I have another question. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the quanti uh, quantitative results? Quanti okay, sure. Well, I think this one. Yeah, so just out of curiosity, because mm -hmm. here you compare the performance for training distribution as well as uh, novel distribution. Mm -hmm. so I'm just out of curiosity that why uh, reinforcing baseline as a uh, beta generalization of BAT compared with greedy policy? Uh, you mean why the greedy policy is significantly bad? Yeah, in yeah. Novel distribution? <laughs> I think yeah. the reason is so in the novel distribution, oh, yeah, like the in, in the figure, we, we have like the triangle, the rectangle. So it has some some sharp corners. So for the oh. greedy policy, it may so the the most failure case of the greedy policy is not because too many collisions, but it's the the most cases it's because the energy consumption is too large. Oh, I since see. It, since it it only follow the contour of the core, so if the estimation has some sharp corner, so it may rotate very fast. Oh, so I see. I can show you the the video. I think this way the gradient noise. This this is ah okay. This one, hey, okay. is it playing? No, I. Ah, I think you you can check my website. There are more videos there, so you can see, see. the gradient part is made rotate very fast. So the energy consumption is too large. So it's not realistic in real world. And so our human may choose to may choose a smooth cutting trajectory to do this cutting task. I see. So um, is there any question from Zoom? If not, so I think it's pretty much it. So let's thanks again for Jinja's presentation.